Amen. All right, the meeting is being recorded. Okay, so we're going to start every week right at 630 because it's just, there's so much information. Um, I mean, we're literally trying to go through 25 chapters of scripture practically every single week. So it's, it's just, it's going to be a lot. So let's pray and we'll get started. Uh, if you're, if you're just coming in, you know, uh, rest easy. Um, Morgan is going to print off more copies of the reading list. If you're watching online, I've got a text into Ashley to see if she'll upload them. Um, I don't know what happened with all that, but we'll, 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 we'll get it, we'll get it remedied. But let's, let's pray here to start. Father, thank you, and thank you for this first week of reading. And as we head into our second week here, it's it's exciting. It just is, you know. We're we're you know looking at what forty six weeks here, and um, we're just one in. So we got a long way to go. Obviously, we're just we're just starting, and um, there's lots to learn. There just is, and I'm excited about this, God. I'm super excited about how many people are watching. Um, the daily devotionals every day. I mean, there's literally nearly a thousand people that are watching that every single day, Lord God, and people that I would have never expected, and, and young people who are watching. How exciting is that? And I just pray, Lord God, that as we go through your word, that we fall in love with it. We really do. It's, um, you know, I, I, the scripture is never cliched, Lord God, but it really is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. And I pray, Lord God, that by the end of this year, all of us will just stand back, no matter how many times we've read the Bible, and just say, wow, that was amazing. And so God, just bless each and every person here. I pray that, uh, you know, this all comes together perfectly here tonight, and that we all learn and we all grow. We love you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. As I pray at morning prayer all the time, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We love you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, let me, uh, let me bring this up online so everybody sees it. Hey, guys, uh, so online, I will stop for questions. So if you have questions, just hold them, and um, we'll stop for questions, and you can just you can type them in uh, in the chat message. Uh, if, if you're wondering how to do that, just go over to the bottom right-hand side. There's a little... Um, uh, text bubble down there in the bottom right corner. Just click on that and your chat will come up and uh, it should say send to everyone. And right underneath it, it says uh, enter chat message here. And um, uh, uh, you can just type your question in. Um, so Matt, I saw, I saw what you typed. So anyways, all right, let me, let me get this up on the screen for everybody. Show me in front of the presentation. Maybe. And there I am. And let's see here. All right. Cool. Okay. So in-house, we are Bible in a Year, January 11th through November 15th. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to do our very best to make it through all 24 chapters of Scripture. Like you just heard me say to the people online, after each topical section, I'm going to pause for questions. Um, do we have like a handheld mic that we could, it's going to be so hard to do that. Um, but can we do a handheld and can I nominate somebody to run around? Dougie, you want to, you want to be the official runner around here? Uh, you'll flip it on when it comes time for questions. So, sorry, I didn't mean to leave you people. Uh, anyways, so we're going to stop in sections tonight, not chapters. We'll stop in sections. So posted, uh, lie on both case, uh, cases. I thought I would have the slides done for her to post them, but I didn't get them done until after she left work. Um, technically, I didn't get them done until about five to six when I saw some typos, so I had to go back and redo them. And I thought the weekly reading worksheets would be up tonight, but for whatever reason, they're not. I keep checking to see what, what's going on, but I haven't, I haven't heard back yet. But I promise you everything will be up and posted by noon tomorrow. Um, 
the, the class video, I think we said last week that it would be up by three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So just by tomorrow afternoon, every, everything will be up. Again, if you're in the room and you didn't get weekly reading lists for next week, I only printed 40 tonight because I did think they were gonna be online. Morgan is over there posting them now. Remember that everything is available at our website and then you click the tab that says Bible studies and then you click the tab Bible in a year 2023 and everything comes up in front of you. Um, again, every single morning I'm posting on Facebook and Instagram, the daily reading, and then just a basic concept of what we're, we're looking at for that day. Usually the video is about five to six minutes long. It doesn't take long. And I'm asking everybody just to like it and share it. I, I had this conversation, I think it was with Debbie this morning. I said, you know, a lot of people struggle to share the gospel. This is a great way to share the gospel. I'll share it and you share it, okay? And I think that'll work, you know? It's interesting because I'm watching the views and there's like close to a thousand views every day. And, you know, you guys are doing a great job, you know, kind of spreading the word. Let me talk too about the reading. Doug and I talked about this before class. If you can read ahead, that's fine. It is. D don't force yourself to read ahead. And if you fall behind, Listen, you can literally listen to every day's reading in 10 or 15 minutes. You can catch up that quickly. So if you fall behind, just listen to your scripture, catch back up, and you'll be fine, okay? What I don't want you to do is get discouraged and quit. You can always double back and read later on. You only have one reading every single weekend, and you can catch up that way. But just don't quit, hang in there, it, it, like we said, and this is cliched, it's a marathon, you know, not a sprint. So, all right, well, let's get into this tonight. Any questions as we begin? Not specifically about the scripture, but, but about anything that we're doing. Anybody have any questions? George, hold on. We're bringing you a microphone. What's well, hard in here because you can't hear, so. Okay, so when you want to... Hey man, share them both, baby. Share them both. No, share them both. Yeah, share them both. Share them both. Any other questions in the room? Huh? All right, we're good. Let's get started. All right, so let's start with Cre. Okay, so tonight we're going through Genesis one through twenty-four. Let's go ahead and start with creation here tonight. First thing that I want to say is, is that scripture is abridged. It's not unabridged. What do I mean by that? An unabridged book shares all of the information, okay? The scripture shares a sufficient amount of information for salvation to come to the individual's life. But if you're looking for some sort of geology text in the first two chapters of Genesis, you'll find that much, but you're not going to find everything. If you're looking for the intricacies of how God created the world, you're going to get the basics. It's abridged. It's not unabridged. You're not going to get every single little tidbit of information. And the entire scripture acts that way, okay? <laughs> If, if, you, if you've never read the Bible before, you're going to have to fall in love with mystery. Had a great question this week from somebody. They said, why a pillar of salt? And I said, well, you know, what do you think? The scripture doesn't say. You know, okay, hey, if you're online, please mute yourself. Because I can hear myself feeding back and I can't mute myself. So if you're online, you hit your mute button. Okay, please do that. All right. Anyways, so you're not going to get all the information. Some of this is mystery. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in. Very first thing that I want you to see in Genesis 1 is, is that first part, those first kind of two verses talk about a progressive creation and that order is being brought 
to the chaos. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the creation begins, and then it says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So what this is showing us right out of the chute is, is what we end with in the book of Revelation, that God is a God of order. God is not a God of chaos. But what we see at the beginning is this chaotic creation that God is bringing to absolute order before our very eyes. It's amazing, okay? So then you get into day one. And when we look at day one, it's a very simple explanation of what was created on day one. Light and darkness, but you also have this, evening and morning. In the Hebrew mindset, day does not begin with dawn. Day begins with the sundown, okay? So it's already Thursday for the Hebrew. Okay, if you're Jewish, it's already Thursday. The sun already went down. We've moved into the next day. We work from sun up to sundown. In the Hebrew mind, they work from sundown, you know, to, to sundown, okay? Every single day, all right? There was evening, there was morning the first day. The universe begins to take form on day one. On day two, simple part of creation is, the atmosphere comes together. On day three, we begin to see the ordering of land and water. And as that all comes together and everything gets in its place, the ground begins to produce vegetation, all right? On day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars get set in the sky to serve as light and to mark signs, seasons, days, in years. One thing I'm not going to get into a debate in this room is whether creation is 24 or seven 24 hour days. I'm not going to debate you about that. I'm, okay. We're just, we're not going to talk about all of that. How we measure things in terms of, you know, the rotation around the sun that was put in the sky on day four. Okay. This is one of those parts where it's abridged. It's not unabridged. We don't know all of the intricacies of the whole thing. All right, Morgan just bought more, brought more reading lists in. They're up here in the front row, okay? All right, day five, we see the creation of sea creatures and birds. And day six, we see land animals and we see man and woman, all right? Adam kind of picks up his name somewhere along the way, but in, please back up, Nathan. I'll call for you to switch it. Adam picks up his name somewhere along the way, okay? But Eve doesn't get named until after the fall, okay? So right now, I'm going to refer to them as man and woman. Now, let's go ahead. Day seven is the Sabbath. Now, I want to give two quotes here. One by a guy named Abraham Joshua Heschel. In light of Martin Luther King holiday that we had just a couple of days ago, um, Heschel marched with Dr. King. He is a, a well-known rabbi who died some years ago and just, um, you know, uh, just an, an amazing Hebrew man. He wrote this book that I read, I'm going to say probably three or four years ago, called The Sabbath. And he writes these words, describing the Sabbath. Again, if you are online, please mute yourself, okay? He who wants to enter the holiness of the day must first lay down the profanity of clattering commerce, of being yoked to toil. He must go away from the screech of dissonant days, from the nervousness and the fury of acquisitiveness, and the betrayal in embezzling his own life. I'm selling my own life out. He must say farewell to manual work, and learn to understand that the world has already been created and will survive without the help of man. The Sabbath is not a date, but an atmosphere. I love that quote. And then there's another beautiful book by a guy named Dan Allender, and it's called The Sabbath. And he gives this defini definition. Sabbath 
is not about time off or a break in routine. The Sabbath is far more than a diversion. It is meant to be an encounter with God's delight. When you take Sabbath, you're not recovering from the six days you spent and storing up strength for the next six days that you're going to spend out there in the labor. This is a place where we're meeting with God, okay? It's a gift to us as a day where we absolutely reunite with our Creator. I am a terrible Sabbath keeper. Uh, uh, you know, if, if I'm looking at my life and I'm examining the sins that, that I need to take a hard look at, Sabbath keeping is something that I need to give attention to in my life. In my head, what do I want to do? Obviously, Sundays are, are not days that I can take a Sabbath. I, I work, you know, every Sunday. I get here somewhere between 5 and 5.30 in the morning, and I'm here till about 1 o'clock, okay? So it is a full work day for me, all right? But Saturdays, I think, is logical for me in my life. I lead prayer on Sunday morning, Saturday mornings. I'm out of here typically by 7.30. I mean, realistically, if I look at my clock, I could do Saturdays from 7.30 to almost su Sunday mornings at 7.30. So you begin to look at those things in your life and say, where am I allowing 24 hours of my life where I'm laboring in no way whatsoever, but I'm re-engaging with God? Sabbath is super, super, super important. And we need to look at that in our own individual life. Okay, Nathan, go ahead and shift. All right, so when you get to Genesis 2, you have a second version of creation. All right, so Genesis 1 is creation. Genesis 2 starts with the, the, the establishment of Sabbath. And then we come back around and we talk about creation again in Genesis 2. I love this passage because, and we'll get to this months from now, on the day of the resurrection, okay, the disciples are all hiding behind locked doors, and Jesus appears. He greets them, and he says to them, I'm giving you my peace. And then he breathes on them and says, receive now the Holy Spirit. That's how the Greek is written. It's not you will receive on the day of Pentecost. That was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the world. But he breathed the Holy Spirit into the disciples in that locked room on the day of the resurrection. So when we begin to look at our lives, how is life quickened? How is life actuated? It's done by the very breath of God. So God forms Adam from the dust of the ground and then breathes into him the breath of life, all right? On the day of the resurrection, new birth begins when God breathes into the disciples the breath of life. I read this book here recently called Backpacking with the Saints, and he in the book was talking about breath prayers. When you see your life in breathing as a conversation with God, Woo! No wonder they're called breath prayers. You're breathing God in, breathing God out with a constant acknowledgement of the presence of God, with a constant submission to God saying, the only reason I have life is because you are sustaining my breath right here, right now. Breath is life. We are sustained by the very breath of God. Okay? All right. Second thing. Genesis 2, 15 to 17, God gives Ab Abraham, God gives Adam a command. If you have your Bibles, take a look at this with me. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. And this is significant. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. All right? So he didn't find his way. God takes him. Okay? He wasn't created in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is just one place among creation. All right? takes the body, the man, and puts him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So if you think there's no, not going to be any labor in heaven, there is going to be labor in heaven. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, 
But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So this is a phrase that I want everybody to, to kind of learn in your life. If you sin, then you die. Ah, I have an update on the list. You know? The, the reading list will be up in five minutes. Okay. They'll be, up, they'll be up in five minutes, all of you online. All right? So, but Morgan made more copies down here. So, we have to think about that. Now, my granny gave an explan a great explanation to me when I was a kid. She said, anything that breaks that tie between you and God, that's sin. And that's what you see in this place. If you sin, then you die. What is death? Separation from life. And that's what you see. God's always present. God's always with us. That's tomorrow's devotional, actually. Okay? But when we try to divide ourselves from God, that is sin. And the result of the sin is division from life. And the division from life is death. Does that make sense? Okay? So if you divide yourself from me, you're going to find yourself in a place of death. That's what God is saying there to Adam. Now, Look at Genesis 2, verse 18, all right? Question, is it good for humanity to be alone? God says it very clearly. It is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Look, this is how it works. This is why God says, when, when he's asked, as Jesus, okay, when Jesus is asked, what is the one thing that we need to get right if we can do one thing right? And Jesus says the one thing is actually two things. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now this specifically is talking about marriage, okay? One man and one woman. And that's what we uphold. You know, I know there's a lot of churches that debate that. But in the Evangelical Methodist Church, in my life personally, that's, that's what marriage is. Marriage is between one man and one woman. And I'm not trying to be graphic here or anything like that. But I used to tell the kids when I was teaching FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, I said, look, any type of sexual relationship outside of the marriage covenant is sin. I don't care if it's heterosexual or homosexual sex, okay? Any, any type of, of sexual relationship outside of the marital covenant is sin. And the only marital covenant that God ordains is between one man and one woman. That's what the scripture says. And I know there's a great debate in our world about that right now, okay? But I'm just telling you what the scripture says. I'm telling what you, your pastors stand for. Now, let me add this in as well. Sexual sin is equal to any other sin, but that's the problem in the church. We elevate homosexuality and we make folks pariahs. We, we absolutely are terrible to people. We can't do that either. We have to be kind to people. We have to be kind to pe people, all right? And it's not one of these, well, love the sin or love the sinner and hate the sin. That, look, that's condescending. Just meet the person where he is or she is, and show them the love of Christ. Just, that's it. That's enough. Just me, look, trust me. If we start rooting around in your life, we're going to find some stuff too. Okay? I mean, that's a fact. You start rooting around in my life, you're going to find some stuff too. <laughs> that's just the way that it is. Instead of saying, I'm good and you're bad, I'm better and you're worse, let's just meet people where they are, and let's all walk to Christ together. Okay? All right. So, boom, done, end of story. How was woman constructed? Okay, why do I use the word constructed? Because the Hebrew says that she was constructed. Where the man was formed, she was like structured. I like that. I like the fact that, in, uh, here I'm going to sound like some like raw, raw woman guy, right? I, I love strong women. I just do. It was funny, we're doing this, we're doing this class on, on Thursday nights at my house so we can learn how to do missions work better at Kingdom. 
And there were a lot of ladies there who said, why did you invite me to this class? And I said, I invited some of the very strongest women that I know in my life to this class. I love the strength of the woman. And that's what this scripture says, that she is strong. It's not like the man is here and the woman is here. We'll talk about that here in just a second, all right? We, we come alongside one another as two beings that act as one, okay? You have been created, constructed strong. Then we have Genesis 2, 23 and 24. When Adam sees the woman, he says, wow, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, okay? And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Now watch this. When you're a child prior to marriage, you have to honor your father and mother that it may go well with you in the land. We'll do that in two weeks, okay, when we go through the Ten Commandments. But you have an obligation to honor your father and mother. But when you move into adulthood, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two become one. So your primary responsibility now is the household, your own household. You still honor your father and mother, but your primary responsibility is that of your own household, okay? That's the primary responsibility. That's the problem. We got too many households that are relying on other households and other people. No, take care of your own household. You see what I'm saying? All right? And when we do that properly, we all come together as one. Okay? All right. Go ahead, Nathan. All right. Now we get over here to the fall. Woo, boy. Look at Genesis 3, 1. And I want you to get this. And this is why this class is so important. I don't want you to guess anymore. I want you to know what the scripture says, all right? There's a passage in Ephesians chapter 5 that says, don't be foolish. Know what the will of the Lord is. That's why we can't be guessing, okay? Look, I, I get it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I get it, all right? But when we pray these kind of passive thy will be done prayers, we're, we're, we're not taking responsibility for our responsibility. We have an obligation to know the scripture and to be able to look at a situation and discern what the father would have done, all right? And so why do I say all of that? Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? That's the problem. And that's where we start questioning. Well, did God say this? Did God say that? Did God say this? Did God say that? Well, this seems right. Society accepts it. Whoa, wait a second. What did God say? What does the scripture say? You know, when things start to get a little goofy around here, we always back up and we return to the scripture. Not that we ever leave it, but you get the point. We return to prayer. We return to worship. We go back to the basics, you know? I want to know this word inside and out so that when the question comes up, this is my answer. This is my answer. What does God say, you know? What does God say? And how can we apply that, all right? So, Satan tempts in three ways. Take a look here, verse six. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and she ate it. Now watch this. Good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. You don't have to turn, but in Luke 4, 1 through 13, we see Jesus in the wilderness, all right? After 40 days in the wilderness, fasting and being tempted by Satan, Satan comes to him and says, if you are who you say you are, turn those stones to bread. 
she saw that the tree was good for food. Okay? The first temptation is food. The second temptation, after Jesus says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The second temptation is this. Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He puts them right in front of his eyes. He lets him see every single kingdom. And he says, if you'll bow down to me, I will give you all of these kingdoms that you've just seen, pleasing to the eye. Okay? Like how many times have you seen something cross your path and you're like, oh, I have to have that. You see, it's tantalizing. Okay? So the eye is the second the second temptation. Third temptation. Satan takes him to the highest point of the temple and says, if you are who you say you are, the scripture says, and that's what Satan does that too. He's a master at that. He'll take a little bit of the scripture. He won't take all of the scripture. He'll take a little bit. And he'll say, well, you know what the Bible says. Well, what does the Bible say? You know, because you're only quoting about half the verse. All right. Okay. He says, the scripture says, that if you really are the son of God, you can jump off of this temple and before you hit the ground, the angels will swoop down and save you. You don't have to go to that wicked old cross. You can let the whole world know right now that you're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Jump down off of here and let them see who you are. Does that sound familiar? When Jesus is hanging on the cross, what is said to him? If you are who you say you are, come down off of there and show us you're the Messiah. Satan's doing the same thing again. And what is that? It's ego. It's arrogance. So watch this. When you turn to 1 John 2, 15 to 17, John says there's only three temptations that you're ever going to face. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the three. And they're all right there in that sixth verse. And it's consistent from beginning to end of the scripture. If you feel tempted in your life, walk it back. You're going to find one, two, or all three of those temptations present before you. Okay? Then, after they sin, there's a blood sacrifice. The scripture says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Okay? So when you look at the tail end... Of the blood, oh, I jumped. We'll go back to the curses in a second. I'll get to the curses in a second. I skipped one. But look at 321. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. All right? So God had a blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Now, this is one of those things where you're going to go, what in the world does that mean? Trust me. As we walk through this year, you will see clearly what that scripture means. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. In order for death to be redeemed, something has to die, okay? In order for death to be defeated, in order for sin to be defeated, something has to die. We'll explain that throughout the entire year. All right, now walk back to the curses, if you would. When the sin occurs, all right, when the sin occurs, in Genesis 3, 14, and 15, God says to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life, okay? And I will put here, this is the key part. Whether or not snakes had legs at one point, I really don't care, okay? It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter. Don't, don't strain out gnats and swallow camels here, all right? Verse 15, and I will put enmity... Between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you'll strike his heel. You, you know what that is. Many of you in this room know what that is. That is God saying to Satan, you're, you're going to crucify him. That, that's the nipping at the heel. But in doing that, you're going to die, and death will die. He will crush your head. That's the curse that's put on Satan. What's the curse put on the woman? Okay, don't blame me. I'm just reading what the book says. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story in a second. To the woman, he said, I'll make your pains in childbearing very severe. 
With painful labor, you'll give birth to children, and your desire will be for your husband, and he'll rule over you. So when Leslie was birthing Tanner, she asked me to rub her back. I did my best. She said to me, our, our, our labor and delivery nurse, was her name was Kathleen. Leslie said to me, you're worthless. Go get Kathleen. <laughs> you know, I think at one point I asked her if I could take a nap. All of this happened on the first child. None of them did I ever do it again. You know, so, but that's the thing. It's such pain in childbirth. And that's part of all of this. The second part of this is this. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. I am happy to have a debate with you on this. I'm not sure class is the best place to have it, but a lot of the things that you're going to see in the scripture, just because it says it, doesn't mean you have to continue to live by it. This is one of those things. Now watch what I'm saying. Patriarchy, okay? I'm the man of the house and you're gonna do what I say. That's a curse. That's not godly. You have to work in partnership, okay? I know that messes with a lot of theology of people. I know that. But anybody that says, no, he's the head of the household. Look, I get it. I get it. He has his role. You have yours, but they shouldn't be this. A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. She has her skill set, you have your skill set, but it's not this. That's, that's a product of the curse. That's why I said earlier, if you think there's not going to be labor in heaven, you're wrong. Let's go to Adam. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, pause. There's a scripture that people take way out of context. You should never listen to your wife. That's garbage. My greatest advocate is my wife next to Jesus Christ, okay? She knows me better than anybody else. If I have a big decision to make, I go to God and Leslie, okay? That's not what that's saying. What he's saying is, you know what I told you. You should have done what I told you to do. That's all it is, all right? You must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat your food from it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground uh, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So when you look at this passage, all right, you see a couple of things here. You see labor as toilsome. We will be laboring in heaven. Why was Adam put in the Garden of Eden? To tend it and to care for it. There is work in heaven, but we will not be toiling, okay? In the new Jerusalem, there will be work, but it won't be toilsome labor, all right? And so you have to think about that. How much of your life, and I'm not accusing anybody in here, but think about it, how much of your life have you spent hating what you do? Like the alarm goes off in the morning and you go, ugh, I hate my job. Right there. Maybe you should find what God made you to do and wake up every day and love your job. Or do what Paul heard from God. When Paul said, gosh, I've got this thorn in my flesh, and God said, Paul, listen to me. My grace is sufficient for you. Strength is made perfect in weakness. So instead of focusing on the weakness, why don't you focus on the strength? See, you have to move outside of the curses. You don't have to live according to the curse. You can, I mean, look, I, there ain't nothing I can do about painful childbirth, all right? <laughs> but we can talk about how you approach your job every day, okay? I can't do anything about jerk husbands or jerk wives, all right? But in your life, you can stop and you can say, I'm not behaving that way. We are going to be kind. We are going to be compassionate. It's Philippians 2. Let this attitude be also you in you that was also in Christ Jesus, okay? Being God, he was living his life esteeming others better than himself. When you look at the passage in Ephesians about husbands and wives, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ so loved the church. 
Okay. How did Christ love the church? When the disciples are bad, when the disciples are battling about who's the greatest, Jesus says, we don't live that way. That's how the world lives. He says, if you want to be first, you got to be last. Okay. The son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so I tell husbands all the time, if you're going to love your wife like Christ, then serve rather than be served. I mean, like jingling the ice cubes in your cup, that's curse living. That ain't Christ living. You see what I'm saying? And that's a fact. No, I'm the man. She'll get me a drink. <laughs> no, you are cursed. I'm not living that way. Now, that's not how God wants us to live. Serve rather than be served and give your life as a ransom for many. Okay? Now, last thing here. Genesis 3, 22 to 24, all right? There's a lot in these first couple of chapters. We'll go through the next pretty quick till we get to Genesis 12 and 15, all right? Okay, why are Adam and Eve exiled from the Garden of Eden? Look at Genesis 3, 22 through 24. This is vitally, vitally, vitally important. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now watch this. There was separation between man and woman and God. They chose death. If you sin, then you die. There is separation. And what he says there, they will go and they will eat from the tree of life every single day. But the problem is they're separated from me. So that tree of life for them simply would have become everlasting existence. John Piper says, oh my gosh, this is a powerful quote. If you could go to heaven and have all of the benefits of heaven, all right, all right, everlasting life, whatever you wanted, all the blessings of life, so on and so forth, and God wouldn't be there, would you go? Sadly, most people would say, yeah. Do you know why? Look at life. Look at life. That's how we live. We want all the blessings. We don't want any of the hardships. But when it comes to devotion to God, I don't know if I want to do that. That's why Jesus says, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. If you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you want to live, you got to die. You see? It's, it's, it's the man that says, I had this debate with a guy yesterday. It wasn't really a debate. It was a discussion. The, the brother that yells out to Jesus, Jesus, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And then he tells the story about the rich farmer who says, wow, look at all that I have. I'm going to tear down my barns and build new ones, and then I can live in luxury forever. And he says, God shows up and says, you're a fool. Tonight, your soul is required of you. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That's what that is saying. And people will choose perpetual existence rather than true life. And that's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, think, okay, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit here, and i got to be careful. Okay? <laughs> think about all the people to do all the stuff to hide the fact that they're getting older. And you just pick it. I am not going to start shouting it out and convicting some people in this room, <laughs> you know, or online. You know, I don't know. Do you need Botox in your forehead? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, you know. This, this one always gets people. Should I color my hair? Thank you. Don't start. I said to mute over there. Do you see what I'm saying? What are you going after? Look, I don't care if you color your hair. I could care less. It doesn't bother me. But if you are saying inside, I have to color my hair so nobody knows that I'm gray, I know how old you are. 
What are you doing? You know, what are you doing? All right, what are you grabbing for? Please mute yourself online. Okay, so that's the whole point. We will do the best we can to, to somehow, you know, not, not do that. Okay, we will do the best we can somehow not to do that. Hold on a second. All right, so we have reached the point of questions, have we not, Nathan? All right, who's got a question? Anybody have any questions so far? Anybody online? What we got? Yes, Bia, over here. I'm assuming they did, but I don't know that for sure. I'm assuming they were sustained by that. It, see, this is one of those parts where it's a bridge, not unabridged. Like, how long were they in there? When we read it, they were only in there for a chapter. I don't know how long's a chapter. I mean, I don't know. Here in a minute, you're going to see 13 years pass between verses. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I'm assuming they were sustained by the tree of life. And when you get to the book of Revelation, it says that's how we're sustained. Okay, so that's the thing. Why did they eat from that? I have no idea. The crazy thing about it is, it's, it's not like they had been fenced in. There was just a fence around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so to speak. You get what I'm saying? They could have gone out anywhere they wanted to go, but that's one of the things Satan does. He puts a fence around the smallest thing and says, if you can't go there, you can't go anywhere, you can't be free. Which is basically, you know, the biggest lie in the world. It's there for our protection. Not, not to hinder us from full freedom. So, and watch this too. Hold on one second, Kimberly. Watch this too. If they had denied the temptation and God would have showed up and said, very good, you know what they would have gained? The knowledge of good and evil. If they would have resisted the temptation, they would have seen, oh, that's what you mean. And they would have gained the knowledge of good and evil. But they did it on their terms, not on God's terms. Does that make sense? So, go ahead, Kimberly. Oh, I got, okay, hold on one second. The people online are saying we can't hear the questions, Kevin. Sorry about that. I covered the room, but not any of you guys. Please forgive me. The question was, how long were they eating from the tree of life? Were they eating from the tree of life? And, and my statement was that, um, I don't know, it doesn't say, but I'm assuming that's what was sustaining them because that's what it says will sustain us ultimately one day when this whole thing comes together, the tree of life will be in place and we will all feed on that. Now I understand a lot of that is poetry and a lot of that is metaphor, but th I think there's some literal components to all of that too, okay? So basically God is sustaining us. That which God provides for us to sustain us in order for them to be sustained, they, they were feeding off of that. So that was the question. Got another one coming. My husband um, said that I was with my own nephew who came to the woman and the king of lost her and hers. And I was like, her children. But reading this, that often really referred to Christ because next line, he will cut your head to kill, foreshadowing the resurrection of Christ, really, Satan being defeated in Christ. So who is the offspring then of Satan? Are we referring then to the demonic spirit? I mean, who, who is the offspring? Well, I, I don't think it's demonic. Okay, so the question is, who is the offspring spoken of in Genesis 3, 15? I do think, okay, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the best explanation is how C.S. Lewis refers to it in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. I think the offspring that's being spoken of there is the offspring of rebellion, okay? Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, and so they almost became a product or, or, or a child of the enemy, so to speak, because they had aligned themselves. That's another thing with the scripture, and we joke around about this a lot here, you know, my love for poetry. A lot of what you're reading is poetry, 
okay? There's tons of poetry in the scripture. And a lot of this is poetic and you kind of have to take your time with it to make sure that you're, you're, you're following along with it. So, okay, any other questions? Yes, Patty. Hold on one second. Hit it. In three forty two, mm -hmm. it says, "And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us." Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of debate on when you see the word us, when God is using the word us. Okay, this is the question. Who is the us that God is talking about? And it's a great question. And there's tons of theories on all of this. The one that I think you need to kind of settle, settle in on, all right, the one that you need to settle in on is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, that's that's the simplest answer. Now, there there are bigger answers than all of that, which people debate on all of the time. But typically, when you see that, it's as though the the Trinity is speaking to one another and saying they they've become like us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, okay, anybody else? All right, so if you've never been part of Kevin Kane's Bible study before, there's a strong chance you are not going to make it through all of the slides, okay? We will do the best we can, all right? But that's why the daily readings, the, the, the daily points, the daily devotionals, that's why we're giving you all of that, okay? I don't want to rush through in here. I want to make sure we, we answer what we can answer before we get out. And I will leave time, you know, maybe 10 minutes at the end of class, 15 minutes at the end of class, that if you, if you need to ask questions about something else, we'll ask about something else. We'll hit the highlights here this evening. We still have, we still have you know, almost 40 minutes to go, but that's why we added the extra 15 minutes on, and that's why we started. All right, we have a question online, okay? When, or do we? Okay. Okay, I got the questions. I read the questions. I read the questions. Okay. Oh, that's a great question. Is the area of Garden of Eden still around? I don't know. I don't know where the Garden of Eden is. And it doesn't say. It does not say specifically. I mean, Byron, I brought so many maps tonight, it's ridiculous. So, yeah. But I got more on the screen. All right. Okay, let's jump back in here and we'll keep on going. Okay. Keep going. All right, here we go. Let's talk Cain and Abel. All right. Abel's offering was regarded over Cain's offering. Why? Very simple answer to that. Abel brought the first fruits, Cain brought the leftovers. Okay. It's funny because people ask me all the time about the tithe. James and I talk about this often. Some churches 100% say the tithe is still in place. Some people say, well, you tithe off of your net. Some people say you tithe off of your gross. Some people say the tithe is not still in place. Here's, here's what your pastor believes. I think everything you own is God's. And I think you should ask him in your life, what should you give? What should you give? And if he asks everything of you, give everything. If he asks 10% of you, give 10%. But never make 10% the benchmark like you've arrived. And don't give less of yourself to God, okay? This isn't like some sort of Kevin Kane patting himself on the back. But years ago, Leslie and I lived in a house that we'd built and we were teaching a Bible study in there. And the house couldn't house the Bible study anymore. So we built an entire house just to host a Bible study. Like who builds a home to host a Bible study? I couldn't put 125 football boys in my house. So we built a house to accommodate 125 football boys. Well, now we don't teach that class anymore. My kids are gone, okay? So now we're looking at our house and saying, we don't need this. We don't, now it's weird because we live in the backyard of my parents, you know, so we're, we're navigating those waters, but we don't need that house anymore. When we built that house, we poured, anyone that knows construction, we poured 31 yards 
of concrete to park the cars. 31 yards to park the cars. 31 yards, okay? I don't know. Is that a tithe? I pay my mortgage every month. You see what I'm saying? And we did that. We did that, okay, to, to, to give to God. We've had multiple children live in our home who had nowhere else to go, okay? When God asks of you, give everything. That's what Abel did. He gave everything, and Cain held back. That's the problem. Now, look at Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7. And in this world today, we struggle with this because no one can take criticism. Well, that's not fair. Most people can't take criticism. Most people can't take disappointment. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read you something that was from my, my devotional time. That is a great book on the Sabbath. Allender or uh, the other one? On Heschel? Oh, you sent me something? Oh, okay. I want to read you something on disappointment that, that was from my devotional today. Disappointment is inescapable but necessary. A misunderstood mercy and when approached properly, an agency for transformation and the hidden underground engine of trust and generosity in a human life. The attempt to create a life devoid of disappointment is the attempt to avoid the vulnerabilities that make the conversation of life real and moving and lifelike. It's the attempt to avoid our own necessary and merciful heartbreak. To be disappointed is to reassess ourself and our inner world and to be called to the larger foundational reality that lies beyond any false self we had only projected upon the outer world. What we call disappointment may be just the first stage of our emancipation into the next greater pattern of existence. Whoa! And this is what God is saying to Cain, okay? The Lord said to Cain, verse 6, Why are you angry? And why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And it desires to have you but you got to rule over that. If you make one mistake, well, don't make two. And if somebody calls you on that, and they have wisdom that you don't have, or years that you don't have, doesn't mean you're less than. Take the education, you know? I remember when Leslie and I were moving from Wheeling to Morgantown, it was one of those March days where it was like too cold to snow, but you know, are, are too, too warm to snow, but too cold to rain. And it was just that messy, yucky. And I remember my, my best friend in the world, uh, you know, kid that I've known since the sixth grade, he was helping us move. And I slipped and I fell in the mud. And he looked at me and he goes, you hurt yourself or just your pride? Like, what do you want to do in that moment? You, oh, my back. Oh, I wasn't hurt. I was embarrassed. It, this is that passage. But it's more than that, all right? If you get caught in a sin, fine. Own up to it and move on. Don't make two sins if you made one. You know what I'm saying? And that's what God is saying there. Cain, you made a mistake. Don't sit there and wallow in it. Clean up and move on. Let's go, okay? Question. When Cain was marked, was that a mark of grace? It was a mark of grace. That was one of the questions I got this week. Somebody said, is that a visible mark? I said, doesn't say. Doesn't say if it was a visible mark or not. We assume it was a visible mark, but we don't know. We do not know. But regardless, he carried the image of God's grace all over him so that people could see, everyone that he encountered could see the fact that the creator of the universe had put a mark on him and it was calling him back to life rather than death. That's powerful. That is powerful. And then Genesis 4.26, how far had humanity fallen? They had stopped calling on the name of the Lord. 
After that sin there by Cain and Abel, generations passed, and then you have, okay, at that time people began to call on the name of the Lord after Seth had been born to Adam and Eve, and then he had a son, Enosh. You're talking decades and decades and decades, and maybe hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Now they start calling on the name of the Lord again. All right, any questions about Cain and Abel? Good, let's keep moving. All right, Genesis 5. This is our first genealogy. I want you to understand, do not skip over genealogies, okay? Because these are accountings of good and bad legacy, all right? You, you will learn a ton if you just take your time and read down through. One of the things you learn in this genealogy is that a guy named Enoch did not die. Daniel quoted him on Sunday morning, all right? Enoch walked so close with God that God just raptured him up, all right? Enoch didn't die. Elijah did not die, okay? Jesus died, but then came back to life, and then he was raptured up, okay? But Enoch and, and Elijah did not die. They were raptured up. If you guys remember Pastor Jim Yon that used to work here, Jim, Jim gave me a great explanation. Enoch walked so close with God that one day God looked at Enoch and said, you know what, we're a lot closer to my house than we are to yours. Why don't we just go to my place? And I just thought, wow, that's powerful. That is powerful, all right? So when you're reading Genesis 5, the genealogy ends with Noah, all right? Now, let's go ahead and jump forward. Look at these first four verses of Genesis 6. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. And then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were also on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were heroes of old, men of renown. What does that mean? This is part of the mystery. We don't know, okay? The easiest one to decipher in those verses is 120 years. Some people believe that that was the time that Noah had from you're going to build an ark and a flood's coming to when the ark and the flood came. I don't necessarily buy that. I think it was the setting, okay, the setting of the life expectancy or the lifespan of humanity. I know what the Bible says in the book of Psalms that three score and 10 is promised, that 70 years is, is promised. And don't, we don't have to have that debate. You know what I mean? All right. But 120 years is the lifespan, okay? 120 years is the lifespan. Um, my, I think it was Cameron when he was a little boy said to my mom's mom, Granny, you're going to live to be 100. And my grandma said, oh, honey, I hope not. <laughs> you know, and you know, you get to that point where, where you just want to be with the Lord. 120 years, that's most likely what this is. There's also a debate in all of these four verses as to when, <laughs> I'm not even going there. <laughs> There's also a debate in all of this. Was there some sort of, um, intermingling between spiritual beings and human beings. You know, yeah, I know. I make that face too. I don't know. That's why this verse there, someday when we get to heaven, we'll go, oh, well, that makes total sense. But right now, it's just hard to grasp. The concept of the Nephilim, some people believe that they got this like superhuman, you know, kind of physicality to them because they were the product of and we'll get into this later, the gods, so to speak, these spiritual beings, they're called Elohim. People are going, whoa, I thought that was the name of God. Capital E Elohim is God. Lowercase Elohim is the spirit world, okay? Those are spirits. And some people believe that the Nephilim were products of that. Some people just believe that the Nephilim were just a, a generation of people who were really big. And some people believe that Goliath was a product of the Nephilim, okay? Just these super huge people, which they call the Nephilim. I, I wish I could answer for you. I can't answer. Google it. You'll find a thousand different answers. You just will, okay? All right. So then you get into Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 6, 5 through 8. This is critical for us, okay? 
Because in all of this tonight, and I know, you know, we've got, you know, 15 more chapters to go and we're just not going to make it. But I want to do Genesis 12. I want to do Genesis 15 because those are the two most important chapters in all of this in terms of what we're learning. But this is important too. When you read in the book of Romans, there is none righteous. No, not one. None who seek after God. That is a statement that is to be likened to this passage that we're reading in Genesis 6. And it's a statement about how humanity's default is evil, is violence, okay? I mean, I want you to just think about how violent our world is. And again, I'm not trying to get up here on some soapbox, okay? But th think about the sports that America loves, you know? Like the UFC, all right? Boxing. And we, I'm, I'm not picking on you, Robin. You can turn your nose up to that. But these are billion-dollar industries. The head of the UFC just smacked his wife on camera. And, and probably nothing will be done, you know? I mean, the NFL is horribly violent, and it's multi-billion dollar industry, you know? I mean, our whole country, and I know a lot of people go, I don't care about the NFL. Okay, we are so driven by sports. And we can say what we want to say, all right? But it was funny when that guy got hurt and everybody prayed over him. And I'm not even talking about that. I told Leslie like two days later, I said, you watch this though. Someone will start complaining because it's money. It all comes down to that. And so when you look at this passage here, okay, Genesis um, uh, 6, 5 through 8, take a look. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of human race had become on the earth. Watch this. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That is an exhaustive statement about where humanity was. And when you take that passage from Genesis and you come over to Paul's earliest statements in the book of Romans, where he says, there's none righteous, no, not one, which is a, a quote from the Old Testament. There's none righteous, no, not one, none who seeks after God. These are big statements about where humanity will default ultimately, you know? And that's why I say, don't pick out this sin or that sin. Acknowledge that there's sin. There's sin. And we sin, okay? And they sin, okay? And that's why there is a need for a Savior. I don't know if you guys remember this about Daniel's sermon on Sunday. It was so good. One of the things that he said is, is that Moses is a picture of Jesus who leads, and this is N.T. Wright, just this is his theology, who leads people out of the exile of slavery, okay, and into the promised land of deliverance to be the people of God. That is a picture of salvation. What you're reading here with the flood, while I do believe there was a literal flood, and listen, every culture in the world, every culture in the world has a great flood story, a global flood story. Every single one has a global flood story. They all do, okay? So it's not just, you know, distinct to Christianity and Judaism, okay? Every major culture in the world has a global flood story, okay? And the picture is... Humanity is sinful, God brings cleansing, and yet there's salvation for humanity present within it, all right? And it's the story of Jesus, all right? I believe this is literal, but it's also a foreshadowing of the coming Christ, all right? Then you see there in Genesis 6, 8 and 9, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. God. See, we always have a foreshadowing of that one, that one who ultimately preserves and, con and, and, and continues life, who saves life. And that's what you see in Noah, okay? And that's powerful, but it's always a pointing. It's always a pointing towards Christ, all right? That's why that passage about Abraham and Isaac this past week was so important. That is a foreshadowing of the lamb of sacrifice. I mean, it's just so powerful when you think about all of that, all right? So let, let, me, let me say a couple more things. 
How many animals and how did Noah pull all that off? It was initially two by two, but he also said take seven additional pairs. Those were for sacrificing. And that was the first thing that Noah did when he walked off of that ark. I also want you to see this. Look at Genesis 6, 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. I don't know what that is. And the floodgates of the heavens were open. I don't know what that is. And rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And I do know what rain is. God is pulling from three different sources there. The rain, the springs of the great deep, and the floodgates of heaven. And that's how the entire earth was flooded to where there was no ground left whatsoever, all right? Now, one of the questions is to ask is, all right, and go ahead and shift, Nathan. We're not going to make it through all of that, all right? How long did the flood last? If you look at Genesis 7, 11, and 12, and Genesis 8, 14, the flood lasted for a year and 10 days, okay? And when the ark finally came to rest, it rested on the mountains of Ararat. We have a, we have a map up here. You can see up there at the top, that's basically where it was in terms of that portion of the world. So you're way, 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 way up north. I think that's in Turkey. My mother would not be happy that I don't know where that is. But um, I do believe that, that it's, in, it's in Turkey. Okay? All right. Now, I want to show you this too. The Noahic covenant. The covenant that God makes with Noah. Look at Genesis 8, 20 through 9, 17. All right? Number one. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease, okay? So there's a regular sequence of seasons. That's why we have seasons. 9.2 says, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth. Humanity rules the creatures of the earth. 9.3 and 4, up till that point, they'd been vegetarians. Now you're allowed to be carnivores but you have to drain the blood out, all right? Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, okay? There are some people, you hear, you know my stance. I don't believe in capital punishment, okay? So there are a lot of people that will look to chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, and say that's God's justification for capital punishment. Your pastor does not believe that. I'm not going to speak for James, and I'm not going to speak for Daniel. I'm telling you what I believe, all right? What I believe God is saying there is, is that we are held divinely accountable for murder. If you murder, you will held, be held accountable by God. Anybody that says that capital punishment is 100% from God, I will argue that all day long. And I'll point to Christ who was being killed by people, and the people who were killing him, he told the Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. He didn't say, send your lightning bolts. He said, forgive them, okay? And then 9.15, God promises that humanity would never be destroyed again by a global flood. One of the things that you're going to also see throughout the scripture is that God um, has cursed the Canaanites, so to speak, all right? Can they come out of that? Absolutely. But again, what he's saying is this group of people, their default is always going to be rebellion against me. And Canaan was a um, was from the 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 the, the father who uh, uh, wait a minute, let me back up. Noah's had, Noah had a son named Ham. He had a child ultimately that resulted in the Canaanites. Okay? And that was a curse because of how he treated Noah when Noah got drunk after um, the flood was over. Planted a vineyard, ended up drunk, didn't realize it, was embarrassed about it, confessed, moved on, so on and so forth, all right? Do me a favor, we're gonna jump past 10, we're gonna jump past 11. Uh, that's the Tower of Babel. That's fine, but we're gonna jump past that. All right, once you go to Genesis 12, because it's 744, okay? I want to hit two more highlights here, and then I'm going to open up the floor for questions. Again, I want you to understand in this study of the Scripture, okay? And we'll hit a good rhythm. We, we did it last year as well. 
we're not going to make it through the entire Bible every week or, or, or this year. We will make it through the Bible, but we're not going to be able to go through everything. I'm going to try my best to hit the highlights. Part of the reason why I did this tonight is so you can see we're not going to make it through. So do your daily stuff. Watch the daily devotional. Okay? Read your readings. Bring your questions here. And then I'm going to hit the highlights when you come into class each week. Okay? All right. Look at Genesis 12. This is significant. Um, Nathan, do me a favor if you would. Um, go to that next slide and then you can come back. Okay? So look up here. Okay? Down there in that bottom corner, you can, right under where it says Babylonians, that's Ur. That's where Abram, Abraham, and I'm just going to call him Abraham from here on out. That's where Abraham starts with his family, okay? His father takes the entire family up to Haran, and they settle in Haran. That's up there at the top where it says Padan Aram, okay? That's where God appears to Abraham, and we get Genesis 12. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, Haran, your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. That's Canaan. That's the Holy Land, okay? From the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, down to the Dead Sea. It's pretty much everything on, on, on the western side of the Jordan River, okay? He says, leave it all. I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Back up one, Nathan. Okay? So, the big verses there are one through four. I really want you to hone in on four. This is so vitally important. When God says to Abraham, or Abram, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. He's saying to this 75-year-old man who has a 65-year-old wife, I am going to produce a child through you too. Now watch this. This is super important. Like this is the entire Old Testament right here. Your one child, Isaac, will produce a child, Jacob. That child, Jacob, will produce 12 sons who will become the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel will grow into a nation of 2 million people. And from those 2 million people, thousands of years from now, I will raise up a guy named Joseph and a guy named or a woman named Mary. I will quicken Mary's womb and from her will come the Messiah. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All humanity sinned against God, okay? God raised up a man who raised up a family, who raised up generations, who raised up a nation, who produced the Messiah, and from the Messiah, all peoples on earth would be blessed. So when you see that Israel is God's chosen people, I guess that has something to do with land, and that is present in this scripture of ours. But the primary, the ultimate thing that it has to do with is that the Messiah would come from the nation of Israel, and all peoples would be saved. That's what God is saying in Genesis 12 to Abraham. Do I think Abraham understood all of that? I don't think he had a clue. But as the scripture plays out, you're going to see this over and over and over and over again. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have life. But the scriptures speak of me, Jesus says. 
everything you're going to be reading in the Old Testament from now until the end of summer, practically, all points to Christ. I'm not going to say it begins in Genesis 12, because like I said with Noah and, you know, even Abel and, and some other places, clearly, okay, even that, even that animal that God sacrificed in Eden, okay, all of that stuff points to Jesus. But this is the biggie right here. This is the biggie, Genesis 12. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. If you will put your faith in that, Abraham, life will be brought to the world. And ultimately, that's what we're saying here in front of the congregation every week. If you will put your faith in the one God, in his Messiah, life will be brought. Life will be brought. All right, 750. I want to make sure we get to Genesis 15 too, okay? Genesis 15 as well. Um, jump ahead, Nathan. All right. Here's the initial conversation. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit. So you're talking years and years later, all right? You're talking years and years later at this point. Probably more than a decade, maybe 15, 16 years. You know, we'll see. No, it's probably about a decade or 11 years. Because when you get to the end of 16, sorry about that, he leaves at 75. And when you get to the end of 16, he's at 86. So you're right about a decade when you get to Genesis 15, all right, that Abraham's been gone. And God comes to him and he says, Abraham, I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham says, looky here, God, I hear you, and I put my faith in you a decade ago, but here's the deal. I left everything for you. I went through a famine. My wife got stolen from me by Pharaoh in Egypt. I had a huge fight with my nephew Lot, and he left me. Then he got taken as a prisoner of war. Then I had to go on a covert military operation to bring him home, and guess what he did? He went straight back to Sodom. And you show up here and you say to me, you're my shield, my exceedingly great reward? Listen, God, you promised me a son, and I don't have a son. In my own home, my heir is not from me. My heir is Eliezer, and he is a servant in my house. So enough with this, I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward stuff. And God says, really, is that a fact? Well, let's go outside and look at the stars for a little bit. And I don't know how that conversation went or what was said, but Abraham has a change of tune right then, right there. And it says, okay, Abram believed the Lord, verse 6, and he credited it to him is righteousness. He dropped the hammer on him, and I don't know what that looked like, but Abram said, all right, you're God again. And then God says, much like he said to Thomas, no, you come over here because you're about to put your hands in my wounds. And that's what happens here in the rest of Genesis 15, okay? And this was a great question by one of our younger attendees here for class. He said, and I love this, and I quoted it on Sunday, in the first communion service, I said, or he said to me, he said, Rev, why, why did God have him split the pieces? And I said, Pierce, it is a beautiful picture. The sacrifice is split. And God has Abram, who is now Abraham, create a road of sacrifice that right down the middle is a channel of blood. And when you read about this blazing torch and this smoking pot passing through, that is the image of God. And God is passing, oh gosh, this is amazing. God is passing through that sacrifice and down that road of blood, telling Abraham and all of us, I will pass through death to bring, yeah, woo! That'll make, it was funny, Daniel said on Sunday, I don't wear cowboy boots, I wear tennis shoes because I like to run. Well, you know what I was wearing on Sunday? Cowboy boots. And after the service on Sunday, I went, I can run in these. Uh, anyways, God passes right through and declares, think about this, R.C. Sproul said this, if I don't live up to my word, may the same thing that happened to these pieces happen to me. 
That is God's covenant. He wrote it in blood. I will bring redemption to all peoples. Woo! And Abraham was never the same after that. He was never the same after that. Man, is that powerful stuff. Oh, my gosh. That was amazing. So, anyways. All right. We got five minutes. And you're going to be like, five minutes? I can't ask my questions in five minutes. How many of you all have questions about the Abraham and Isaac sacrifice? Did that mess with you? You did, Sandy? Uh, George. Or George. Doug. Sorry, I'm looking at George and talking to Doug. And Okay. This is huge for people. I've settled in with it. I've mulled this thing over for years. You're not the first person that's asked that question this week. We don't know for sure because it doesn't give a real good timeline on that, okay? I'm assuming that he's older, okay? I've heard upwards of 18 to 20, 25 at that point, okay? We don't. No, because Isaac was pretty deep in when, when Abraham ultimately dies, okay, um, and when he gets married. So I, I think he was probably teens, early 20s. That's kind of what I was thinking. So. Anyone else? Or questions about anything? Yes, Brenda. We can't hear their questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'll ask the question here in a second. Please forgive me. What the question was, how old was Isaac when uh, Abraham took him up Mount Moriah? The answer is, I don't know because it doesn't say and it doesn't offer a sufficient timeline. There are a lot of theories about it, but I think somewhere between 18 and 30 probably. So second question. That's why I was, okay, so why do we have Nephilim if the Nephilim all died in the flood? I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. That, that is the honest answer. I do not know. Does it make sense? Maybe that was still going on. Maybe that's how they continued to sin. There is, uh, there's a theory, which it's just a theory. If you want to read the book, the book is called Unseen Realm by a guy named Dr. Michael Heiser. He's not some fly-by-night quack. He's the scholar in residence at Logos Bible Software, which is a highly respected Bible software. And he's saying, oh boy, here we go. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just telling you it's one theory. That when you read about the table of nations in Genesis 10, that over that table of nations was placed a spiritual being. So like later on, when you read about the king of Tyre, that's not the king of Tyre. It is the king of Tyre, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a demon who was in charge of, of that portion of the table of nations. So maybe that, you know, I'll use a, you know, relationship between women and spiritual beings. I don't know. Maybe it still existed. I wish I could answer your question. I just, I can't answer the question where the Nephilim still were from. So, anyone else? I will do my best next week, now that we've gone through so much here this first night, to reduce it down to the big points. What I need everyone to do, including you online, okay, all right, is come with your questions, all right, and I will leave time at the beginning and the end to ask what you want to ask, and I'll hit the highlights in the middle. You're not going to be getting this much information in intricacy like you did tonight. We did this on purpose tonight so you can kind of see. All right, we've got a long way to go here, and there's lots to go through, all right? But bring your questions, and no questions are bad questions, okay? All of the slides will be up in the morning, 
Ashley said, let me take a look. She, she texted me. Let me take a look. Make sure that the reading lists are up. Yep, they're up. They're up. Okay, so those printed handouts are now on the website. The slides will be up tomorrow. The video for tonight will be up tomorrow as well. So, all right, bring questions next week for me. Do my best to answer them. Um, stay with your daily readings. Watch the daily devotionals. We'll hit the highlights and we'll kind of go from there. All right, let me pray with you and I'll let you go. Father, thank you for tonight, and I think we've illustrated here this evening just how much there is to go through. You know, there are 24 chapters. We missed most of it here tonight, Lord God, in terms of um, the intricacies of each story. You know, from, from Adam and Eve up to Noah, we were able to focus on some things. Genesis, or, uh, Abraham with Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, those two things are truly the most important parts of what we were going through here tonight. As these weeks go on and on and on and on, Lord God, help us to see the most important messages so that we can come to Christ, be built up in the faith, and carry the gospel out to the world. Those are the most important things, Lord God. And when we learn the scripture inside and out, not so much from an hour and a half class on a Wednesday night, but through our day to day to day to day devotion to it, we're really going to start growing in our faith. So God bless these folks as they engage their reading over the next week. Make it almost through the end of Genesis by the time we meet again. And I pray, Lord God, that they feed on every word that comes from your mouth. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, everybody. God bless you. Stay with your reading. I'll see you next week. God bless everybody online. We'll see you next week.